Hello, so good morning in Colombia and good afternoon in the UK. We are the Performance Embodiment and Digital Archive Conference. This is our second uh, amazing talk with two uh, great speakers that we, that we have bring together today. Uh, we have with us um, Maria Alejandra Estrada Fuente. Um, Maria Alejandra is researcher and, and lecturer at the Royal Holloway University of London in the Department of, of Drama, Theatre and Dance, and Maria Andrea Garcia, uh, which is a dance movement therapist uh, based in Colombia, but also with experience in the UK. Um, they will tell us a bit more about themselves. So today, uh, the topic that brings us is the Care for Curse methodology that both of them have been working through research and, and also practice-based with them and have this, uh, this talk that will be uploaded on our website and transla translated into Spanish later. Okay, so thank you very much, both Marias, for joining us today. Um, I want to start with a with the very very first general question. So, if you can tell us a bit more about your background and what the Care for Curse methodology is, and how you got involved in this methodology. So, we can start probably with Maria Alejandra, if you want. Okay, hi. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here in this space with you, both of you today. Um, I I have a dance background. Um, and that's that's where I, I start as my interest with embodiment and embodied practice. I was a classical ballerina for 10 years and I have studied different art forms since. I was also a performance artist. So let's say that I approach this kind of work from an artistic perspective, um, thinking and, and knowing that the use of art is fundamental for conflict transformation processes and that um, the potential for the transformative potential on, a, on an everyday life is, um, is constantly overlooked and unexamined, in my opinion, um, because we focus too much, we're focused too much on the, on the kind, of, kind of the public side or the spectacle of things instead of the daily practice of, of care and how art can contribute to care as well. So from this artistic work, I um, eventually started working with ex-combatants, minors, in Colombia, in the reintegration process. And so the term for that is desvinculados, and that's a different category from adult ex-combatants. And I started working with an interdisciplinary team, a group of dance movement therapists, psychologists, um, circus artists, philosophers, social workers, um, and art therapists. And there was an, a drama therapist as well, interested in how to um, contribute from the arts to these um, changes. And um, fr from that, I, I learned uh, as a carer for, for this kind of communities, children who have been involved in armed organizations are considered victims. So from, from working as a carer in this, in this project, I learned that... Um, it is a very diverse field. There, is, um, there are so many different approaches to care and that usually caregivers um, need to learn how to establish limits to their care practice and also to try and develop um, everyday activities or everyday routines that help in keeping um, a good balance in their lives. And that's what I've tried to do with my work and my research ever since, try to, to find academic research and tools that can contribute this kind of um, grounded and grassroots initiatives um, in Colombia in particular. So that's, that's me. Okay, I shall continue. Mm, yes, I come, from, um, I, I come from the psychological perspective. I am a psychologist. Um, like the first study that I did in my life was psychology, and then I then I went into dance movement therapy or dance movement psychotherapy, more known in the UK. I'm also a teacher, and uh, my my body embodied practice comes also from when I was very little. I always danced, 
I did jazz, I did ballet, but later on in life, um, whilst I was studying psychology, I also practiced contact improvisation for many, many years, and like for 10 years, and I also did um, Hi Aikido, which was, I think, uh, both of those practices enriched my, my connection between mind and body in a, in a very big way. And from that perspective, I've been working on, of course, obviously for, uh, through DMT, dance movement therapy. Mm, I, I guess from when I started working in psychiatry around year 2000, I, when I became a dance movement therapist, mm, I started recognizing the importance of caring for myself. As the first year, I was completely exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally, and it didn't have to do with my life directly. It was something else. So when I realized um, that I had to change my lifestyle if I wanted to practice and be a therapist or a psychotherapist, I realized the importance of um, care for carers, which is not taught really at universities, not included in those curriculums. Um, later on in life, when I came back to Colombia in 2008, I started coming to um, plant the seed of DMT here. And there was something happening very interesting at that time in Colombia, which was um, the recognition of victims, the official recognition of victims of war in Colombia that has been happening for 50 years, no? So what happened was that all the um, institutions of the government were approaching victims or ex-victims of war and treating them at many levels. Um, attending them is called more like psychosocial attention, no? So at an emotional level, at a physical level, helping them out with their, giving them back their, um, their um, yeah, I don't know, like goods, for instance, that were taken away from them in the conflict, like the territory and the whole thing, no? So in that, at that very moment, what happened is that I started working with the IOM Institute of um, the International Organization for Migrations, developing a strategy to care for all those um, ser civil servants who were working with uh, victims of war, because some of them were psychologists, but most of them were uh, social workers. They had other different backgrounds that never trained them to treat or to be holding so much pain and suffering. So in that um, context, uh, with a with a Colombian uh, team of psychologists, we started developing like a national strategy to attend and to care for all those professionals and non-professionals who were caring for victims all ages and also not only individually but families and communities. And since then onwards, I've been developing also my own strategy. Uh, incorporating body and embodiment uh, within all the stages of attending care for carers. So it's a bit, a bit long, but I arrived to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Can we explore a, a little bit more of what the um, care for carers methodology is, how it is applied, and can you give us some a few examples of how the methodologies apply and how embodied practices are involved in the in the technique or method can we how can we call it or how do you call it is a technique is a method is a um, strategy strategy mm -hmm. um, shall I shall I start go yeah give me your perspective brilliant um so i i think i think there is i think it's important to to kind of recognize that there is in from my perspective i think it's important to recognize that that there is no such thing as a method or a strategy um to work in care for carers um there are so many different possibilities, there's so many different options, so many different practices that can be implemented 
and 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 used. And it's important to to think about the needs or the of the specific communities that one is working with, and uh, and their preferences. Um, also, I think it's very important to think about the context as well and what kind of practices work in specific context contexts. So when when you know um, Maria and I we we work in with different communities, but in a very similar context, which is a context of a protracted armed conflict, um, ongoing armed conflict, um, when there are issues of, of care that go beyond um, just thinking about, you know, something that you can do maybe in a safer way here in the UK. So there are like other implications that come to it. Um, so I want to, I want to, bring that into into the attention here because um for example in in a place you can have um, an, an art therapist doing a fantastic work and then having public display of that work in ways that can't really be done in certain places so i want to to draw attention to that that is for me is more about what kind of strategies and mechanisms can be implemented rather than a single methodology so having said that, I have worked using um, drawing, painting, improvisation, um, dance, theater games, um, collective performance practice, always thinking, what is it that we need to work on? What is the goal? And what is the community? And what can they do? And what, what's difficult to do with this community? So always thinking about who am I working with? And what, from this broad spectrum of artistic practices, what can I use? Um, so I, I, I have like two brief examples. When I was working with ex-combatants, with, with minors, um, I used a lot of collaborative devising practices, which in other words is improvisation games, theater improvisation games, depending on the topics that we needed to explore. And I used them in different ways, different types of improvisation games for about two months until we could actually uh, um, arrive to the actual work that needed to be done. And, and then from this playing and, and, and engagement in a fun way, um, we, could, we could start building some trust that took time, you know, minimum two months of constant work, it took some time. And then for us to be able to explore uh, more difficult subjects in in ways that felt safe for everyone involved, for them and for me as well as a carer. I think something very important is like I, I was too very exhausted uh, from that work, and I needed to learn how to take care of myself. Um, now that I am working in another project, we are trying to use um, more what we call now like mindfulness practice because it's a different kind of community and the type of physical work and improvisation doesn't really work with this group. So it, it depends on the community. And I think that more than saying, oh, I have this particular method that I want to just kind of parachute into this group. It's important to first look, observe and listen, and then try to identify what can be implemented. Um, so, that, that's, that's what I want to offer for now. Maybe we can, after I listen to Maria, maybe we can have some exchange right there. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think it's important to uh, sort of give a um, profile of the people, that, the population I work with, no? So normally here in Colombia, uh, the care for carers, as I mentioned before, our psychologists, our uh, social workers, our lawyers, our judges, our um, community mothers, and they're called like that, which are people who, who work in the community for somebody else. Um, professional uh, community leaders as well, so people who work with victims. And now I don't even stay too much with just victims of war because 
all these people as well are victims of poverty, are victims of the state, are victims of um, violence, of all sorts of intrafamily by violence, lots of different victimizations. See, at the moment, I'm also working um, even with people uh, who work, like educators, who work um, with the um, penal system, how do you call it? Um, yeah. Judici judicial system? Yeah, judicial system. It's like the, the young young offenders who are going to go back into, the, into society. Uh, we work with them as well to care for them because they have to deal with these youngsters who have not developed um, most harmonious ways of communication. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. So basically the profile are professionals and non-professionals who are dealing constantly in their, in their everyday life and work with people with high levels of suffering and difficult ways of communication using mostly violence or non very functional ways of uh, resolving conflicts and so on. So that's the first thing I want to clarify. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, um, the care for carers, which I'm familiar with, comes from a, uh, from a theory There's various theories that we can um, be enlightened by in order to look at care for carers. One of it is the ethics for carers, which is to do more with some religion, religious background, and that informs more like the care that the nurses do. But there's a whole theory about it in the background. But what I have um, been informed more by is like the multilateral organizations uh, have developed uh, from the 70s as strategies and um, actually a language that help us understand care for carers. And this comes very much from Argentina and Chile after the dictatorship. They realized the psychologists and all the all the people in the South, that they would get burnout out after caring for the mothers who have lost their children, after being dealing with people who have had a lot of suffering or have been holding a lot of suffering. So they would burn out, and that was it. They wouldn't want to work with all these people anymore. So they started building up a strategy to support all these professionals and non-professionals who were caring for high uh, levels of suffering, people with high uh, experiences of suffering. And that's where I come from. That's where I draw from. And I am going to uh, see that. <laughs> I'm going to quote uh, some ladies called Aroni Llanos, for instance, in, in Chile and Argentina, who developed like a strategy, a form, a structure of dealing with care for carers. They all, I, I also have to say that within the idea of care for carers, we must look at the risk that these people have. Why? Because as ev every worker has a risk. Every worker has a risk. I can be a builder and the risk is that the brick will fall on my head. But what happens? I can wear a helmet and the, it, the risk is visible. That's what I mean. However, the risk with people like me who are my, psycho, are my psychologist or a psychosocial worker or whatsoever, the risk is not visible. It's invisible because it affects our emotions. It affects our way of thinking. It affects our beliefs, and that is invisible. So very, it's very difficult to detect When are you burned out? When are you traumatized vicariously? When are you, um, when you have contamination, like um, thematic contamination? So this is why I, I will start exposing why it's very important. The first, first um, um, element that it's completely pivotal in this work is... Uh, self-awareness and self-awareness this is when the body comes into fruition so importantly you know 
the body is the first place. Well, not, not really the first place. Actually, it's the energy, then the emotion, and then eventually it hits the body. But people only realize when they are affected, when, the, when they feel gastroenteritis, a chronic head um, headaches, chronic back aches, a constant fear, fear perhaps, um, tearfulness, um, so many signals, you know. So basically, that is the first um, element, or yeah, element to work with. Um, careful care is just become aware, mm-hmm. and the body is is absolutely key in this. I have designed, I think, well, I think it is a general, uh, it's an exercise that it's worldwide, but I have adapted it uh, into into this context and it's called body cartography. And what I ask and invite the people I work with, first of all, is just to lie down, start breathing and connecting to the language that the body talks, which are sensations, are emotions, and just the subtle sensations, a little bit of change of temperature, pain, um, bloatedness, so many sensations. So that's the first step I work, uh, I introduce into my methodology. Um, then uh, we start working also with the body in order to transit all this emotion that's in your body. So it can be by shaking, by moving, by dancing, by writing. But I explore through the body many ways to transit the charge. Because what happens with these people is they get charged. Well, we get charged. (laughs) And sometimes I cry in order to release. Sometimes I move. But the body is excellent. It's an excellent alley in order to transform the emotion that cannot be yours, you know, sometimes through empathy and through um, through connection with the other, sometimes not always, actually. Uh, we feel what the other feels. So it's very important to be able to trans- transmute all this energy energetical energy, etc. Uh, energetical, no emotional energy, and that's what I wanted to say. That all stays in your body. So we need to recognize it and then be able to move it. So this is like in, in general, in a general manner, I present how I use the body. However, I also want to say that within the model I work with in careful carers, it has three dimensions. So we work from the institutional care, care for teams, because the teams also wear out and they also suffer from burnout, and then self-care. Institutional care is to do with what the institution does for their employees, starting from the payment, holiday, extra. I mean, the UK is brilliant on that. Colombia, mm-hmm. big time. It really, it's really appalling. Uh, Then the care for teams is very important because if the team gets burned out, what happens is that the relationships amongst the team become really exhaustive, violent as well because they can replicate what goes outside, inside, what they're perceiving outside from the people they're working with. So they replicate it within at an unconscious level. That's really important to recognize. And the third level is self-care, autocuidado, which is to do with the individual. And in that sense, for me, is the most important. Because in the UK, as I say, perhaps the I remember working there and being very well paid because I was working in a psychiatric hospital uh, because they were taking care of my emotional risk. However, in Colombia, it doesn't happen. So it's very important um, to take responsibility of the signals of where, um, of the sources of where, and also about your protective factive, uh, factors or protective factors. What do you do to mitigate all these affectations? Yeah. 
So from that sense, uh, yeah, the theory that I draw from has a, that structure that I've been presenting to you. Not to say it's the only one, no? But it's the one that I am mo mostly familiar with. And within that, I've been um, incorporating much more body practice as that's my nature. Thank you. Can I, can I, can I say, can I respond briefly to that? I think, I think it's, it's really, really important what you're saying about the, the awareness and self-care um, as one of the key components um, and the burnout. And there's something that I find that is very common in different care sectors, um, whether you work directly with affected communities or hospitals or in the teaching sector as well. In a way, you know, it, teachers are carers as well. Um, that, I, and I remember hearing this in many places in, in Colombia, in different, in different contexts as well, thinking um, someone, I remember someone saying once, uh, there, is, there is a lot of joy that comes with this work. And, you know, the pay is not so good, but it's so rewarding that you're going to be happy to be able to do it. And that's so toxic. That mm -hmm. assumption that because we have the privilege and the opportunity to care for others, that then that's, that's it. That's all you need. Um, that's a very toxic culture and a very toxic assumption. And it, it also contributes to that, uh, what you were talking about, the, the, the burnout. Um, and having, you know, ignoring the cues that your body is giving you. Uh, yeah. Because we are, we are taught to, for example, just, you know, you wash the dishes and you have a back pain, but you're like, oh, just shake it off. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we're constantly um, taught in our everyday life that we need to ignore that, those, those little cues, that little warning, that little thing. I have a sore throat. Oh, it's okay. It's nothing. Um, and we need to reclaim that. Um, it's so important. And I think that, that in that sense, our work, um, that was what I was saying, work with different communities or some overlapping as well. But the, the point that I, that I find so interesting is how it is important to go back to the body, to slow down, to listen, to notice, to really pay attention. And then from that, we can care for ourselves and we can be ready to care for others. So that kind of taking that step back is so important um, in all the different sectors as well. I agree. I want to add up a little bit to what Maria says, which I think is very interesting what you've been talking about, because uh, there is something very missional uh, within all, uh, all of us, <laughs> including myself, because I, I absolutely agree that my, uh, what, I, what I do as a woman therapist working here in Colombia with, um, with a wound, with a human wound in Colombia, Definitely is part of my, my life, my life mission, my soul mission. So, of course, we all work from that place, which is a very, very generous place, but sometimes it doesn't have limits. And we must understand that we need to care for ourselves first. No, we need to really care for for our well-being, because if we are burned out, we cannot help anyone. Yeah. So that is absolutely essential, what you say. And this I find in Colombia, that the boundaries of the professional hat or the professional relationship with the victims or with users of the service are erased, are so invisible sometimes, and people end up in such personal situations, such as giving money to someone because, oh, no, the state is not going to give it to them, so I might help them personally. And then what happens is that the relationship, the professional relationship, uh, disappears, dissolves, and then it becomes a big problem at, a, at an emotional level and uh, at many levels, yeah. at expectations. So I think it's really important what you just mentioned. And the, the other thing... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the other thing is the, the disciplines that you mentioned as well. Those those who care or who who end up working in this in these caring jobs, they don't necessarily have the the basic training to be able to understand that. So you know, psychologists that like you are trained 
and for that um, psychiatrist, you know, you, you have go through university, you have at least a, at least a course that teaches you about um, the ethics of the involvement with, with your, your patient or the person that you're working with. So there's some kind of idea in your head. But if you end up being like an artist or a lawyer or an economist, having this kind of work, um, there is no real awareness. And even if you do have that training, sometimes it just goes over your head <laughs> and you end up um, engaging practices that, that are very detrimental for your own well-being. And as, as you just said, um, if, if you're burnt out, you can't really do what you, are, what you need to do well. Um, and I'll just stop there. <laughs> Um, it's fantastic because all the questions are <laughs> solved in the conversation, which is great because if there is time to, to go to, to more specific points. And listening to you right now, and also uh, we had yesterday our first opening event, and we were talking a little bit about this, and there were questions about this, how through this kind of practices and, and research, all research, but also artistic and, and practice-based Um, strategies or projects to deal with conflict and victims, how we guarantee or how are we aware of no trauma, 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 housing, tra trauma, housing them again, no, but not just victims, but also the audience, no, those who listen yeah. to the stories, those who read these stories, and those of us who research these stories. So, mm. Can, can we talk a little bit more about that? How, how we deal with that situation of not becoming this trauma bigger and how you, for example, when are applying these methodologies, how are you dealing with situations where, where the victims, um, revive these emotions, mm -hmm. these and then external audiences, researchers? How can we be more aware of this or which kind of strategies, tools can we apply? in order to mitigate this kind of re-trauma situation. That has a name. I actually want to say it to the audience. That's called vicarious traumatization. And that is recognized as, as, a, um, as a phenomenon that happens to people who work with um, people who are traumatized. We can trauma be traumatized vicariously just by listening, by reading stories, by listening to the, to the narrations of the others. And the one thing that's, I mean, uh, for this, I've been reading a lot of uh, trauma uh, literature, for, for instance, Van der Kolk and many other people who are just focusing on trauma. And uh, Babette Rothschild is one of the greatest uh, authors on these uh, embodiment practices for trauma. And once you've understood this, you can realize and you, what you can do is to listen, but without connecting your emotion and allowing those sensations to occur in your body. This is the tip, which is not very easy to do, but because it re re uh, needs a lot of, requires a lot of self-awareness. So what it says is that please read the story the moment you feel a sensation in your body that leads you to feel pain, sadness, anger, frustration, impotence, or whatsoever, leave the document. <laughs> Go out, look at something else, um, disconnect from that. And again, come back with a fresher mind and with a fresher <laughs> emotional state, I suppose, and go back to it. So that's what Babette Rothschild suggests, you know. So you can manage that, but you have to have self-awareness. The moment you connect to something mm. uh, is to do with a wound. I mean, uh, from the psychological point of view, also it has to, I mean, we all, and this is what I talk to people in my workshops a lot, we all have wounds. We have human wounds. I mean, we all have been uh, left. We have, uh, we have been abandoned. Uh, there's hard the broken, so we've lost people which we loved, uh, people have been betrayed us, I mean, we have wounds. But what happens is when we read these sort of stories, maybe people have been also abused. When we read these stories and when we are listening to these uh, narrations, 
maybe some of that story resonates in our wound. And this is why we break down. This is why we um, feel the pain of the other intensely. But it doesn't have to do with the other necessarily. That is just an input or a stimuli that triggers our wound that hasn't been resolved. So I always recommend people like us who work with deep and heart pain to go to therapy. <laughs> we, need to, we need to heal our wounds in order to be able to support the others. And we need to transit our healing process in order to be with the others and help them heal. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard. Couldn't possibly agree more. <laughs> but sometimes that's that's difficult to do. Um, it, it it requires a lot of resources, and I think that's you know that that's part of the change that needs to take place. Um, because you know when, when going back to this culture of caring that is a bit heroic and 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 you sacrifice yourself for the others. There, there is something there is something very poetic. And kind of um, romantic, yeah. yeah, extremely romantic, and 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 soul damaging um, in that kind of way of thinking. Um, so, so more resources and 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 time to open those spaces for those kind of um, practices, for those kind of um, self care strategies to be incorporated and really thought of, you know. Yeah, we have this desire to help and, and to and to serve others, but you know, we need to think about sustainability and how to make this healthy for those who who engage in that work. But uh, yeah, complementing to what you say, Maria, is you can do supervision within the psychology practice. You can do yeah. supervision, which is a space where you elaborate a bit more your experience facilitating a space or facilitating an individual space or a group space. Also, exactly for that, you implement and you incorporate within the working exercise, you in, uh, incorporate a care for care strategy that accompanies parallelly the laboral exercise, whatever it is. So this is the way you can sustain the system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, these people are going to burn out and disappear. And then new people come in, burn out, and disappear again. And this yeah. is the whole process of, as it works. Mm -hmm. So what this is, and, and actually, I've been lucky to see it work here in Colombia. Some teams don't have any care for care strategy, and, every, and it's very chaotic, the whole system. And when, from the beginning... And from a preventative stage of care for caring um, is incorporated, the system goes through, although with many upheavals, because it's not easy and with crisis, but they can go through it and they survive it and they learn from it, which is the idea. The idea is not to burn out and to uh, exit the process. The idea is to learn through it, to have a learning curve mm -hmm. and come out alive and healthy, although with the learn with the with the teachings, no? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think it's really it's it's really interesting that we we're talking here from two very, very different disciplinary perspectives. Um I I have an arts background and I, I, I work mostly in academia. Uh, and I have experience in the field, but I don't have the, the clinical training that you do. And there are many people like me that are interested, you know, artists that are interested, you know, let, let's, let's, let's contribute to this, let's do this. And, and there's a lot of damage that happens um, there from, from a, a, very, a very good place very good intentions, but a ver also very naive approach to practice. Mm -hmm. And and I and I say that as um, you know, conscious that uh, there is this saying in Colombia, el, el infierno está lleno de buenas intenciones. Like hell is full of good intentions, 
that you can have really, really good intentions and a lot of enthusiasm and do harm. And I think that this, this, this issue of, of re-traumatization and how to take care of the audience and how to, to work with narratives is very important. And I'm going to, I'm going to address this from, from, from the artistic point of view and the way in which I have been able to engage with my work um, with, with this awareness. Um, and then I would really be excited to hear um, your response to this. Um, I, I avoid narrative. I avoid um, talking about specific issues. And I think that's the power of embodiment. Mm. You can work through painful experiences without having to talk about them. Um, you can work through painful experiences by being aware of what they do to your body, noticing things, um, and learning how to let them go. So if you have like a very intense emotional, um, emotional manifestation in your body, you can work that through your body it, with different artistic methods um, to be able to do that. And that's what I do in my work. I don't invite the painful story um, because I, I don't have the tools or the power to be able to deliver a change. And I think that's my ethical responsibility as someone working from academia with an artistic perspective, going to work with communities. Um, and I've worked on issues of gender and sexual violence a lot. Um, and I avoid the narrative. If the experience is, if the, if the participant offers something, of course, you, you open the space for that. But I think that this, 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 this idea that oh, we, need to, we need to be confessional and we need to talk in order to be able to heal, it's not true all, all the time. And it's not always the most responsible approach, I find, in terms of the participant or the person that you're working it with, but also in terms of audience members. So, for example, um, there, there is like a really, really interesting example here in Northern Ireland. Um, there was this play that was, um, it was called Once I Knew a Girl, and it addressed issues of, of, of sexual and gender-based violence that took place during the Troubles. Um, and it was staged about, I think it was about nine years ago. And one of the things, and, and it was narrating painful, difficult experiences from perpetrators and victims. I have a problem with those divisive categories, but those were the people who were on stage. What they did afterwards is that they had, they had um, coffee and tea for audience members, and they stayed afterwards. And they had a group of therapists and, and, and the artists, the practitioners as well. And they stayed afterwards to hold conversations and to try to work through what had happened together. So again, resources and opening the spaces for those kind of healing experiences to take place is very important. Um, but for me as a practitioner, I, 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 I believe and I, I know that the body is a powerful place where you hold your emotions, where you experience your pain, your suffering, and you can also heal through your body and through movement. And it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of time, but it can be done. And it has been done. And I mean, you, you know that. Um, artists and, and practitioners have been doing it for a very, very long time. And now science backs up that kind of intuitive um, awareness. So I, I was excited that you mentioned Van, Van der Kolk, um, one of the first people working with um, um, veterans suffering from PTSD from the wars in, 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 you know, in the 70s. Um, and this man works through embodiment in many ways as well, um, integrating different disciplines and backing up the findings with neuroscientific research, which is wonderful. So um, the body holds everything and we can work through the body. But as an artist and as someone who works with communities, through a, a, a short period of time, um, I try not to invite narratives unless I am doing um, in-depth interviews and that 
requires, you know, a different kind of preparation. But for my artistic or art-based intervention, I, I use the body, not the language. Yeah, no, I completely agree. But I think you're talking about an already an inter a direct intervention with the yeah. victims. So in that sense, I mean, if we are, if I am working directly with victims, surely I don't invite narrative because that mm -hmm. even from the trauma, uh, trauma um, thinking and I and uh, academia is not recommended to invite because I can re-traumatize. And you don't need to ask for it. I completely agree. And I can, I totally back up what you mentioned about um, the body being so powerful to, to heal. Because the unconscious, from my perspective, which is very Jungian, it, the body holds the, un un the unconscious. So you can heal without even talking and without even having a cognitive process or a conscious process. So I do agree when working with them. And I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, now, the narrative, and this, I think this is what you mean, because talking with care for care, I mean, the caring for the carers with the professionals, which is quite of the filter from yeah. us who work with them, um, The narrative, the words are used are very useful because they're not talking about their personal experience. They're talking about what the effect of uh, the narrative or the experience that the other ones, the victim, have um, shared with them. Mm. So that's a different level, I think that. But I completely agree with what you say regarding direct intervention with this client group, with victims of war. Not talking about the careful, um, the carers who care for them. Mm. Mm. Well, um, I have two last questions for both of you to address. And, and I'll, I'll bring, I will bring them that now for you to decide how to, how to conclude this event. But my first one um, is how we bring together or, and also to, 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 to think if we really need to bring them together, this psychological or, social, or psychosocial work with the artistic work. Uh, in my experience, uh, working with artists too, uh, there is the belief that through the arts and through the embodiment and the performative body, we are able to Um, overcome or at least to, to work on these situations of vulnerability, trauma or poverty that you were talking about, that was in the preparation that we were talking about, not only victims of conflict per se, but also victims of poverty, victims mm -hmm. of, of marginalization and so on. Uh, what, how do you think we can bring together these worlds or are these two different worlds to work with the same issues? Or is there any point of common to bring this dialogue between the artistic, the performative, and the psychosocial uh, work of a dance movement therapist, for example? And my last question is, uh, thinking about, because another part of this, of this conference is the digital archives and all this digitalization of, of the humanities and research and so on. And uh, in the preparation for the talk, we were talking about how you have been, um, no force, but how with COVID situation you are practicing or you are conducting these care for curse methodologies through uh, with the use of digital tools. So which are the ethics, the responsibility as practitioners to bring all these stories into the screen? into Zoom, into, I don't know, YouTube, or, 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 in, or all these tools that we, we, we have to use now in order to, to come together. So how are you coming together through the digital with, with the victims and, and populations you work with? Bueno, pues, the first question. How do you join psychosocial perspective and the artistic work? 
I can only talk about it through the arts psychotherapies, which is the field that I've been learning for, that I've been learning for 22 years. But I think that is exactly what the creative arts therapies do. That's exactly it. Trying to, to connect and dialogue between the arts and the psychological theories. That's exactly what they've been doing. Now, I say something that is important, that is um, the arts within the arts psychotherapies have been informed from a very psychodynamic, um, systemic perspective from the, psychology, from the psychological uh, theory. However, not from the psychosocial. And I think one of my big challenges in this context in Colombia is exactly that, is how to articulate the psychosocial perspective, which is different than a clinical and a psychological perspective with, within the dance and movement and the, uh, and the body work. Well, with dance movement therapy, actually what I've been developing in all these years that I've been in Colombia, that is now like seven, almost eight years, is how to conjugate, how to uh, fuse or how to articulate much better um, the psychosocial perspectives, psychosocial objectives with, um, with, the, with DMT actually in the work for victims directly and in the work for care for carers because most and i must make this as a quote almost but the government in colombia has chosen the psychosocial perspective to attend address and intervene the victims of war is the common is the common perspective that all institutions have um, chosen in order to work. Why? Because the psychosocial perspective allows that the symptoms, which could be very clinical, um, can be seen from a psychosocial perspective, which is is all these symptoms that people have, like post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, sadness, violence, flashbacks, tons of symptoms are not due to a clinical or pathological illness. They are due to something abnormal in society that is called war. Yeah? So, um, so that's part of the answer. <laughs> another, another bit of the answer I'm thinking is that the artistic work, in summary, what it gives in all the media of the arts, it can be music, it can be dance and movement, it can be theater techniques, or it can be a plastic, a la arte plastica, plastic art, is that it gives a priority to the non-verbal language. Mm -hmm. And why is this super important in this sort of population? People in Colombia, people who have been engaging in war, are people that mostly are not educated, that normally don't have resources. Colombia is not like the UK, that everybody has the right to go to study. Here in Colombia, is not like that. <laughs> we, the government does not care for the, the people. So what happens is that you cannot apply a psychological uh, narrative or verbal um, intervention to this population because a lot of them haven't even gone to school, they barely read or write, so they connect more with a drawing, with the language of movement, of dance, they connect with the language of improvising, with oral, orality, because orality really is central within the community. And remember, the war doesn't happen in the streets, in the big cities. The war happens in territory, in the obliv ob oblivious, no, um, olvidados. In forgotten the places. Forgotten, thank you. The forgotten places in the territories where there is no state, where there is no nothing, basically. So this is the people that we work with directly, yeah? So the arts are essential. And yeah, they're essential for, for this population. And even for the youngsters and the people who work with those people, the eyes have much more of an ample, they amplify the, uh, the, um, the ability to communicate, actually. 
Yeah, and Colombia is not a cognitive culture like it could be Argentina or it could be Europe, no? That we're not intellectuals here. We're people who vibrate from the emotion, first of all. So to, to deal with just psychological therapy and just talking is not going to work. So that's why I totally believe that the arts are the most, um, I feel very passionate about it, I, 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 the answer to dealing and healing, actually, in this context. I've said that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I love what you were saying at the very end, because uh, I, I, I'm a theater lecturer. I work in a theater department. I don't have a theater background. I didn't grow up in a culture where, you know, I was going to, to see a play in a community theater, like in my neighborhood or whatever. I grew up watching telenovelas. You know, that's the language that, that, that you need to, you need to, to know your culture. You need to know, that's what I was saying, you know, to work, know your, your community and know what is useful and what's not. So like getting all sophisticated in terms of the kind of practices that you're going to come and implement. It's like, you know, step back, observe, notice, and then see what can, what is possible doing. Um, know your audience. Uh, is 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 fundamental, you know. Um, know knowing the audience is, is so good, and yeah, it's like, uh, you know, Shakespeare is great, but you know, telenovelas, you know, and it's, it's 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 a different type of language, um, and 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 I I couldn't possibly agree more that um, artistic forms can touch us in a different ways, and they, they can also create. A, a, a different common ground um, mm -hmm. between practitioners and communities. It, it is it is a shared, a common ground. Um, but, and this is not to say that one thing is more valuable than the other. It's about borrowing and noticing what what is what is useful and helpful and working with what you have at hand. Um, and in that sense. Um, and, and thinking more about how, you know, whether we should bring them together, like the arts and the psychosocial um, approaches or, 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 or the world. Of course, I think, you know, artists, we should inform ourselves more and learn more about these different theories and, and, and schools and ways of understanding human experience. And the same for the other side. You know, we uh, psychologists and and And, and social workers and all that, they, they, they need to get on their feet and also to, to recognize that they have a body. Uh, so from gaining that understanding, then you can actually work with other people from that perspective. And that's the way in which I approach the care for carers in the work that I do with, with carers working with ex-combatants themselves. It's like, you know, notice that you have a body and, and work with that and then when you're working with your community, you can explain things in a different way and you can transfer um, the skills and this knowledge in a different way. But it's like we need to get on our feet together, um, artists and, and, and people working from, from the social sciences perspective and, and, and create a shared language um, because there is so much energy and And time that goes into translating. And you you mean this, and you mean that. Let's let's create a, a common ground so that I, we can work together more and more and more. It's so important. Um, so yeah, we should we should we should go to a party together and, and keep doing that. Keep doing that work together. It's absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I I agree with that. Thank you very much. That was amazing. So we are running out of time, but I don't want to leave you without having a brief reflection, reflective conversation or intervention about the digital and bringing yeah. careful curves into the digital. And with this, we close our session and open questions for the audience. Okay. Uh, basically, well, I've been working from Zoom and actually there's been a lot of um, invitation to do careful carers because uh, all the people, apart from the... Um, apart from the weight that they carry with, um, due to the nature of their work, 
Now on top of it, they have to work at home. They have to do homeschooling. They have to clean, wash, um, have their children like you saw mine coming into the meeting. And there is no intimacy anymore uh, with your work, with anything. Mm-hmm. So um, the COVID, I mean, the COVID circumstances has really increased the risk of people to burn out, to feel fear, to feel anxiety, um, to, uh, to have difficulties in their relationships, to relate, actually. There's been a lot of tension, violence, anxiety, depression, mm-hmm. exhaustion, and they're doing even more work than they used to do. They have no boundaries between their personal life and work. That is one of the things that I've been working on a lot. Uh, so they end up working until nine o'clock and they have their lunch in their desk, but they never have, but they feel guilty because they haven't seen their kids and so on. So ultimately, just to say that with the circumstances that the COVID-19 has brought to our lives, it uh, has a... Uh, it ringed the bell up much louder to say more need for care for carers. So, in fact, I've been doing it. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of more work through Zoom. And actually, at the beginning, I was a bit reluctant to do it. Mm-hmm. But after a while, I realized that definitely the people who connect do get a lot out. So I do all my body work, stay, I mean, through the camera, lie down, breathe in, breathe out. They do exercises that discharge your tension and energy. A lot of the affectations that I've been seeing, for instance, is people with pain over here just by sitting on the desk for eight, nine, ten hours. They have a lot of um, affect, uh, affectations or affections on their back uh, spinal body. So what I've been doing is just inviting them to lie down, to breathe, to stretch, to move, to dance, to release to talk and also to get a bit of insight into what are the, uh, their signals in their bodies, in their emotions. And people also, you know what I've been realizing is that one of the things that they've been missing a lot is to contact, contact, human contact. Because they don't have it, I invite them to touch themselves, to do a lot of work with touch, touch with props, with a little um, ball, uh, do a lot of self-touch. It's been really important. And also to be in touch with others, with social life. So I use Zoom, which is wonderful because you can separate people into rooms and get a little bit more intimate. So I've been doing that a lot and giving them spaces to talk about their lives, their personal lives. Before in their offices, they used to maybe walk around and while they had a coffee, talk a little bit, oh, my son got ill or I'm a bit bored with my husband at the moment or this happened or so on. But they have lost all this. And that is a big, that creates a big wound in them. So it's been working, actually. The Zoom has worked. Uh, is better than nothing, much better than nothing. <laughs> That's been my experience for these last six, eight months. Yeah, um, d- definitely the, the pandemic has been quite challenging in, in many ways. And, and um, you know, speaking as someone, I, I live by myself um, mm. in, here in the UK, and I was planning to go to Colombia um, to do some field work on, on my care for care project. And my flight was canceled just like a week before. Mm-hmm. And I have been unable to leave the country and all of that. So it's been, it's been quite challenging. But that thing that we, we have been talking in different ways of how there are no limits between the personal and that professional and how those spaces are overlapping and kind of crushing in uh, or on top of, of, of each and every single one of us has been a recurring theme in the work that I have been able to translate into digital formats. So one of the challenges that I've had, because we, we, we are working, uh, I'm part of a project between the University of Warwick, Royal Holloway, and the Agencia para la Reincorporación y la Normalización, the Colombian Agency for Incorporation and Normalization, that they work with the uh, former combatants in the reintegration process. So we've been developing this, this care strategy with caregivers, um, those people who work directly with the ex-combatants. And we started working on this several years ago, and this was part of, you know, 
a, sec, a, a third moment of that process, going to do the field work. And uh, at the beginning, I was totally crushed. And then I thought, you know, we, we need to, COVID has, COVID is going to have long lasting impact in the ways in which we relate to each other, in the ways in which we communicate, even within, you know, this small town that I live in and, and the work that I do at the university. It's going to be different and we need to adapt. And I, I thought about, I tried to think about it as an opportunity. Okay, how, how can we keep the work going? And as you say, like delivering in, in a way and really getting the work done. Um, so we've been having, we've been having Zoom calls. I don't use Zoom, I use Teams. And we've been having these team calls um, with small groups um, over several weeks just to have the conversations and get some feedback. And I've been, I've been recording tutorials. So I think about myself as, I don't know, the, you know, you have Daniel Samper, like, do you do the Cuarenta? I'm the influencer <laughs> now working with, with this thing. So I, I'm, I'm creating tutorials that I upload on, on, you know, breathing exercises and moving exercises um, that I had been working on with them and trying to translate them into this new format. Um, and then I sent those tutorials and people do with specific instructions that like you have to do this twice a day and then we meet next month. And then we meet again with those, those small groups, no, no more than six people in each group. And it's been intense, labor intensive for us. Um, so we meet again, we have conversations, some feedback about the exercises. And then from that feedback, I devise a second and third and fourth um, delivery of tutorials. Um, and that's the way in which we've been trying to keep the work going. And in a way, I, I have found it really helpful because one of the challenges of doing arts interventions and getting going to work and doing a workshop and whatever is that it is so hard to have some sustainability so this has allowed us to engage in a longer process and to have more ways of collaborating and having more conversations and feedback. So it has extended a visit that would have lasted one month into now a six month process. Um, and it's still going, you know, I, 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 am, I am working on the second set of tutorials and we have a website, um, we have had to to work a lot and think really hard around the ethical implications and data um, because it's a research project. So we have very strict protocols, but the University of Warwick has given the funding, has been quite supportive in finding ways of working around these issues using new technologies and we are making progress. Um, so I hope that in a year's time, we'll have like a, a small collection of tutorials and feedback. And, and this is really, it, it, what I like a lot about it is that it, it is really devised and built in collaboration with the feedback of the people who are working on the ground right there and experiencing things on a daily basis. So something that I think, oh, this could be useful and helpful and, and great. They're like, no, it doesn't work. You know, you need to be thinking. And, and, and that's been great. That's been really good. So that's, that's what we are doing at the moment. Um, and, and as I said, and as you said, you know, it was kind of reluctant. How do we do this? But, you know, let's just embrace the opportunity and, and you know, work with the challenges. Yeah. That's super interesting, the tutorial idea. I would love to see them. I can share them with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, interesting. And what about this, now that we're talking about sharing, for example, can we upload some of this information and tutorials on our website, for example, or are you able to share them with public that wasn't involved in the practice in terms of the ethics and, and how you care for these processes and images that you are recording? Oh, well, yeah, no. I mean, yes and no. <laughs> One of the things that we... we that I don't do in my work is to take photos of or, or images of, of the work in progress. So for example, you know, when I'm working on, on, on teams and having this conversation, there, there's no, there are no images of that. There are no name records or anything like that. Um, in the tutorials, it's just me 
and my cats. Occasionally, they jump into the tutorials. So that I could potentially share, but when the, when the project finishes, um, not at this stage because we're still working on it. Like in, in a public way, of course, I can, you know, share privately with you, but because it's an, an ongoing project, it can't be, it can't be made widely um, available. But um, one, of, one of our goals for this grant that we have, one of our, of our final goals was to be able to devise a set of digital um, tools for people to be able to access them. So that's, that's something that we're working towards too. It's just that the pandemic has made things um, faster, <laughs> move faster in that direction and has made the process more collaborative. Um, so eventually I would love for this work to be part of the archive, <laughs> but at this moment, uh, it, it's not there yet, but the idea is that those tools would be made widely available for people to use, um, across, you know, the globe. <laughs> I, I would I would ask here in the IOM we created for you well in 2015 2016 we created a tools for care for carers which is in Spanish and includes performative expressive and narrative techniques to care for carers with detailed step to step um, detailed description of the workshops and of the tools and the exercises. So I could probably ask if we could share it because it would be lovely to share it worldwide. It's in Spanish is the only problem, but it has like a concept paper with a theoretical uh, background and then a practical tool uh, toolbox with care for carers exercises from the perspectives I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it would be wonderful if people can use it around the globe so it's not lost. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's why I'm asking, just to use these platforms to, re to, to make information available for anybody. But yeah. it's also this, this kind of thought of to what extent we do really need to share everything. So that's mm -hmm. another thing to, to think about it. But if we can make these platforms available for this, we'll be, uh, we'll, we, we'll, we really like to, to offer this place to promote this kind of work. So thank you very much to both of you. It was an amazing talk, very, very, very illustrative and very rich. So thank you very much for sharing with us your work, your background, your experiences and your feelings, emotions and affect towards the care for carers and the work with victims and forgotten people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.